Nash is one of those kind of charismatic scientists that has the uh, ability to communicate what's happening with psychedelics and the research to a broad audience. He's also a Bitcoin entrepreneur. So he's one of those people that kind of travels around, um, <clears throat> I guess, painting the picture of what the future could look like with psychedelics, with technology, and arguably you could consider psychedelics a form of technology. Um, I won't bang on anymore. I'll just bring him up. If you're ready to go, Prash, please uh, make him feel welcome. Thanks, Ash. Um, hello, everyone. Might take a seat. Before I start, I just wanted to thank Greg for bringing up that idea of joining the Liberal Party. Um, more so from the from from the sense of it's much harder to affect change from the outside than it is through from the inside. And I think we all we need Trojan horses on the inside to change opinions that way. I think it's been a long time of us banging on um, as a minority, marching around with big signs saying, free the weed. And that hasn't really gotten us anywhere. Um, so I think, you're, yeah, you're on the right track, Craig. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Um, hello. Uh, they ha I think the title <laughs> was, I had, I had, they had me down as speaking about psychedelics and technology. Um, and sort of done the psychedelics and cryptocurrency talk right in this venue before. So I wasn't going to repeat that. Um, I thought I'd talk about something a bit more topical, um, particularly with how many of you have heard of the psilocybin trial um, at St. Vincent's, supported by PRISM, with Martin sitting right there. Um, and seeing as that's been in the news uh, recently and it's something that we should all be quite proud of, I figured I'd talk about something related to that. Um, psychedelics, I guess, thank you, uh, Ash, for making the introduction. Psychedelics is a technology for change. Um, and perhaps look at the, the, the how or the why um, psychedelics have benefit from a therapeutic angle, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so there are a few different hypotheses, I guess, that we can approach this from. And I'm going to call them hypotheses because we really, really don't have definitive empirical proof for any of this. Um, and this is what the, 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 the scientists um, will come back at us with because, well, there isn't really definitive proof, right? You can, you can establish association, but not really causality. Um, so I'll present a few different hypotheses. And the, the first would be the biochemical hypotheses, the, the idea that the substance itself, the psilocybin, the, the LSD, um, enters your brain and causes this um, miraculous biochemical change um, that has lasting effect. That's just not true. Um, and that is something that is often brought about by the scientific community, the medical community, um, whenever I talk about things like this, and it's a, it's a hard thing to sort of shift because that's the way other medications, other drugs work, um, at least from a medical standpoint. Um, even in psychiatry, that's how your antidepressants are, apparently work. And your antipsychotics apparently work. It's a direct effect. Um, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy works by a quite different form. It's got much less to do with the chemical effect of the drug itself, but more to do um, with the experience that it then opens up. Which I guess leads us to sort of a next, the exploration of another hypothesis, which is the, the sort of neuroscientific model. Um, and I'll draw two examples, perhaps. Um, I guess because we're talking about the the psilocybin trial here. So for those of you who aren't that aware, um, the trial, well, that we've got a, that St. Vincent's has got approval for, is the use of psilocybin for end of life terminal anxiety. So in palliative care populations, um, for people who are dying and are faced with the death, the, sorry, the anxiety that comes um, with imminent death or being faced with their own mortality, um, the idea that psilocybin assisted psychotherapy can help relieve that. The entropic brain theory, is that a term that's familiar with people? Uh, Card Harris and his group um, released their paper on the entropic brain theory, I think it was in 2016. If you've read it, congratulations, because it's 16 pages at like sort of size eight font. Um, and it's a heavy, heavy read, but one of the most important papers I think to have come out. And what it sort of broadly speaks of is the idea that in the psychedelic state, there appears to be an increase in brain, well, in entropy 
um, within brain circuits. Entropy is, um, I guess, in a way you could call it chaos, um, but a less organized state of being, uh, a more diverse set of connections. So fMRI studies, this is functional MRI studies, which look at blood flow to different areas of the brain while in the psychedelic state, showed that areas, areas of the brain which normally had very set connections or set forms of sort of blood, blood flow p- patterns, um, under the psychedelic, uh, under the influence of the psychedelic state, um, those distinct blood flow patterns were distinctly reduced. Now, intuitively, sometimes that sounds like, well, that doesn't. What does that say? Does that mean that psychedelics are reducing blood flow to the brain? Isn't that a bad thing? That doesn't seem to make sense. What it's really saying is that the set modes of thinking, the set modes of operation that the brain has that we normally function in, are being broken down. And when that's being broken down, you are forced to develop new ways to, I guess, approach a scenario, new ways to think. Um, Mendel Kalin, who is a neuroscience PhD um, student, he may have completed his PhD now uh, at Imperial College London, whose second job is also to design the playlist for the psychedelic therapy sessions, which I think is a great job. Um, He does a TED Talk where he has a great analogy of uh, a ski slope. um, And imagine a slope where with sleds going down them. And by the end of the day, you've got so many set sort of, what you call them, trails, that if you got on a sled and went down, you'd end up down the same sled trail that a hundred others had gone through before. Um, And that you can think of psychedelics as a sort of avalanche that comes by and flattens the snow, which means that now when you go down that slope, you end up finding multiple new routes down that slope. uh, I think it's a quite a convincing analogy. Um, and we've got fMRI studies that seem to back that up as a theory of sorts. Um, briefly, another sort of uh, another example would be uh, the use of MDMA, which isn't, a, I guess, a, tic- a, a, a typical psychedelic, but we call it a psychedelic-esque substance. And MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD um, has been, well, it's one of the biggest drivers of this way, really, uh, with Rick Doblin and MAP supporting it. And if you look at the theories behind why that has been, well, it seems to be quite effective. One of the problems with PTSD that make it so treatment-resistive, I guess we can't call it treatment-resistant because... People do recover from it, although it's difficult, it's time intensive, it's resource intensive, and there's often what they call treatment fatigue because people just really struggle to get get through therapy. And one of the reasons why is that any attempt to revisit the experience, revisit the traumatic experience and work through causes this huge emotional flooding, which makes it so anxiety provoking that it's almost impossible to get through working through the experience. Now, if we, if we think about how memories are laid down, simplifying it slightly, that two, you can think of two broad categories of the way memories are laid down. There's the autobiographical memory of the actual event, um, and then there's the emotional memory of the event. Try, imagine, imagine the word nausea, and if any of you try and remember uh, what nausea feels like, the instinctive response is usually the negative connotations that come with it, right? You feel the yuck effect more so than you perhaps recognize the peristalsis, the squeezing of your esophagus as the food comes up. That's a much later memory that's usually dwarfed by the yuck effect. Uh, again, fMRI studies into the MDMA state showed reduced blood flow to, distinctly reduced blood flow to the regions of the brain that are often connected with emotion, the, the amygdala. Um, which, again, we can only establish association, we can't establish causality, but perhaps leads to the idea that if you can reduce the blood flow to the amygdala, if you can reduce the emotional response to trying to draw back a memory, then perhaps it gives you a better opportunity to work through the actual autobiographical events of the memory without being so flooded that the anxiety prevents you from actually moving forward. Um, Now we'll go go back to that little nugget that I gave you earlier. We're talking about um, psilocybin and the psilocybin trial for end-of-life anxiety. And the sort of third hypothesis that I might touch on, which is a much more esoteric one, I guess, would be the more transcendental or psychological or spiritual, whichever way you want to call it. From 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 a psychological point of view, if we use the example of those facing imminent death, one of the main problems with facing imminent death is that death implies a loss of the sense of self, cardinally. Um, And that is a huge ego blow 
it's huge ego blow because we we hold on to this sense of self very strongly it defines us as a person and our egos are intrinsically connected to that the ego is a very necessary evil at times but it's a necessary structure the ego is what scaffolds your your psyche it's the it's the it's the fortress around your soft mushy insides you know at one end of the ego spectrum you have narcissism and at the other end you have complete anxiety and the role of the ego ideally you know, in a, in a, in a uh, adaptive sense is to modulate that spectrum um when you're faced with an imminent loss of your sense of self, that ego flares up. Um, and, and that's an anxi extremely anxiety-provoking state. Now, we're probably all familiar with the idea of ego dissolution that comes with the psychedelic state. Um, and the idea of being able to work through a therapy session that gets you to a point where you're able to dissolve your ego to a point where you're then able to process the idea of this loss of a sense of self and then to look at it from a more spiritual perspective, I guess, where you're able to let go of the idea of the sense of self as being anything at all beyond just a construct of your own imagination. Because very often that's what it is. Um, perhaps allows you to re-emerge on the outside um, with a renewed sense of, I guess, of vigor towards what is to approach and perhaps less fear towards this, this impending demise of what is really impending demise of the body and an impending demise of a false, a false structure, a, f a false construct, um, which is that, that sense of self, which is nothing more really than an abstract figment of the subconscious. Sort of, that's something I thought I'd leave you guys with, just sort of three potential hypotheses behind um, psychedelic therapy and why um, it seems to have so much benefit. Um, before I go, I th one thing I'd like to reinforce, there's a big difference between therapeutic use of psychedelics and recreational use. Um, and when we talk about legality, um, we're talking about um, decriminalization, it's sometimes important to draw the boundary or the distinction between the two. Um, there's a, there's a divide in the schools of thought within the psychedelic uh, paradigm. Um, you have people like Rick Doblin um, from MAPS who are firmly on the um, pushing the therapeutic angle, pushing regulation, getting it legalized, and from, from a top-down level is the way to go, is the way to, to um, bring this into further into the mainstream. And on the other hand, you have people like David Nichols, not the David Nichols that Greg was talking about, David's David Nichols from the DMT Nexus Network, if anyone knows of him, who's a huge proponent of underground therapy, um, who comes very much from this maybe the Timothy Leary school of thought of like we we have these substances with so much power that it, it is a crime to not allow these to be utilized um, and you really push the underground therapy uh, movement um, and that the bottom you know the sorry the top the bottom up approach is really the way for mainstream adoption I don't think there's a clear answer to this um, because the top downers will tell you that the bottom up approach only serves to distance you further from the regulatory bodies and the, the bottom uppers will tell you that the top down approach is just taking too long. Sorry? An integration would, of both would be good. Um, yeah, it would be good, but it's often easier said than done. I guess. Um, and I, I don't know where I stand on this, um, but I just want to voice that as something to be aware of. We can sometimes be extremely gung-ho about our approaches towards psychedelics. Um, and they, are, they, they aren't always productive. And we do need a balance of both, um, like you said. So we have people like Greg fighting the hard fight on one end. Um, and we have people trying to influence things from a top-down approach. But no one approach individually, I think, is going to make the difference. Um, and it's something I thought I should leave for people to consider. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Prash. Um